1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you're there, say yes. yes. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I wish I'd known that on Thursday. <laughs> he waited till Sunday to tell us. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Another translation says always. Somebody holler, rejoice always. always. Verse 17, say it together with me. Pray without ceasing. Verse 18, let's say it together. In everything, give thanks. Let's do it all again. Verse 16, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Last line, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts today. God, may our spiritual antennas be in tune with the frequency of the Holy Ghost. And we'll pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. You may be seated. For a few minutes this morning, I want to talk to you about praise under pressure. Praise under pressure. When I was a little boy, we, my parents would have never thought about going to Sam's Club or Costco or BJ's. We didn't have them in those days anyway, but they never would have thought about going to the grocery store. Ingalls was our grocery store when we lived in North Carolina. And bless God, Piggly Wiggly was the store <laughs> in South Georgia. How many know Piggly Wiggly? Whoever came up with that name had to be a redneck, I'm telling you. But my parents never would have thought about buying store-bought peanut butter and crackers. They just never would have. We made our own peanut butter and crackers. And mama would buy a box of saltine crackers. And she would have, uh, on a good day, Jiffy or something like that, Peter Pan peanut butter. But most days it was whatever the store brand was because that's what mama bought. And... Uh, when I wanted peanut butter and crackers, I would make my own. And then we didn't have video games and Atari. And back in those days, if you had cable TV, and we were fortunate enough to have, have it most of the time, you didn't have 500 or 1,000 channels like you do today. You might have 20 or 30 channels. And uh, so we didn't have all of the technology back in those days. So you had to make your own fun and have your own fun and one of my favorite things to do was to get out the peanut butter and crackers and put my own, make my own peanut butter and crackers and then I would squeeze those crackers and watch the peanut butter come twirling through the little holes in the saltine crackers come on how many of you know that you've done it too haven't you and, and the moral, he's done it too, praise God. The moral of the story is, or, or, or the object rather, is to see how much peanut butter you can get to go through the little hole under the pressure without the cracker collapsing. And similarly, when you and I are under pressure, we wind up seeing what's on the inside. Because when that pressure hits our life, out of the abundance of the heart, you begin to see all the issues that, uh, that come from the heart and you begin to see what's on the inside. And sometimes that's not so much a good thing because we realize some things in our life that the Lord has to clean up. But secondly, we also realize there's an awful lot of good people that live in this world as well. Now, I want to remind you, I know you could watch the news and, and, and especially the crime spikes that's in the country today. Uh, we're living in some very difficult times. It, it is the days of Noah uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be upon the face of the earth. But, but likewise, also on the flip side of that coin, we have a lot of good people in this world today as well. Neighbors that have been helping neighbors, checking up on the elderly and those that, are, uh, that may be uh, homebound, making sure that, that everyone is okay. And, and, and I, I, I've heard such heralding reports about some of my, 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 especially Caleb, my son, his redneck boys and buddies, that, that first thing they did, they got those big old trucks and as soon as they heard the levee was about to break, those boys got their ball caps and cowboy hats on and their boots on 
on and they got in those big old pickup trucks and they headed down to where the waters were to go and find people and to rescue people. They got their boats out of their backyards. Come on, thank God. We got a lot of good people in this world today. They hooked up their boats and headed south to help those that were in need. Because when the pressure hits, we find out what's on the inside. We also find out there's some things that simply aren't too important anymore. The clothes that we have on, they're, they're not too important anymore. We realize when it's a life or death situation that some things that we were fanatical over in the past just simply aren't as important anymore. And the Apostle Paul here to the church at Thessalonica reminds us that we should be praising God always. We should be praying without ceasing. That we should in everything give thanks. It's a reminder and a formula to us when we walk through the hard times of life. God, I will bless the Lord at all times. Your praise will continually be in my mouth. Lord, I may not praise you for the hurricane. I may not praise you for the damage, but I'm going to praise you in the midst of the hurricane. I'm going to praise you in the midst of the damage. I'm going to praise you when I'm wet, and I'm going to praise you when I'm dry. I'm going to praise you with electricity. I'm going to praise you without electricity. I will bless the Lord at all times in everything. Give thanks. Somebody holler, rejoice always. Now listen, you can be a negative nanny if you want to be. But I have found you can find something to praise God for in every circumstance. In every situation. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. You woke up this morning with breath in your body. You woke up this morning. God's been good to you. He's fed us every day. He's clothed us every day. And, and this may not always be Bible, but it's, it was what Mama said, so it's got to be close to the Bible at least. And that is you can always find someone worse off than you are. So thank God for His goodness. Can you say amen? Amen. Now turn over in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 30. All of this reminds me of a little story when David and his men came back home to Ziglag. And when they came back to Ziglag in 1 Samuel chapter 30, they found out that their city had been destroyed. They found out that it had been burned, that the Amalekites, the enemy, had invaded and they had came in and taken Ziglag. They burned the city down and took their wives and children as slaves and captives. They didn't kill them. They, uh, worse, they took them and used them as slaves. At least that was their intention. And when you and I walk through a process like what we walk through this week, along with our brothers and sisters in further south Florida, those that are on the east coast of Florida, those that are on the coastline of South Carolina, when the, uh, uh, Ian re-entered the, 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 uh, the, the mainland, we walk through a process when we see the utter devastation, when we don't know if we're going to make it or not, or we evacuated and we didn't know if there would be anything to come home to. And the Bible says that when David and his men came back to the city, they saw it burned with fire. They saw that their sons and their daughters and their wives were taken captives. And in verse number 4, the Bible said, Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. When I saw the images on Thursday morning that came from Sanibel and Fort Myers Beach and Fort Myers, Naples, all of that area, Punta Gorda, Port Charlotte. It was hard not to weep for my brothers and my sisters that were in that region. Most of us just simply had branches down. It was going to be a nuisance to clean up and an inconvenience. And most of us, we didn't have power. 
And in our home, we're on a well. We didn't have water when we don't have power. And so, you know, you, you, you got all of the inconveniences of that. But when you looked at the devastation from our brothers and sisters to the south of us, that very easily could have been us. Sometimes all you can do is weep. Sally was telling me about an image that she had seen on the news of a man who had made it. All of the homes in his neighborhood were destroyed and it showed him an image of him sitting in his carport or driveway, sitting in a chair, drinking a cup of coffee the next morning. And by the end of the day, his house had caught on fire and burned to the ground. That poor man thought he had made it. He thought his house had made it. He thought somehow, some way I escaped. And yet, <laughs> within just a few hours, his house was burning. Sometimes all you can do is weep. Somebody holler, weep. I want to give you the process today about praising under pressure. There's a time and a place to weep. The Bible says weeping endures but for the night. And sometimes the night is dark. It's a dark place. And some of you have walked through dark seasons of life to where you just need to weep. You don't need to hear words. You don't need somebody to come and tell you it's going to be okay. you got to get your system flushed. No one in this room ever wants to be taken to one of those small little private rooms at a hospital. I've had to be in that room before many times, both personally with my family and secondarily as a pastor. No one wants to go to that room. No one wants to be led to that room to be told some awful news. And the reason they put you in that room is for privacy so you can weep. So you can have that time for that emotional response. And I want to tell somebody in this room today, it's okay to cry. The shortest scripture in your Bible is Jesus wept. And when you need to cry, you don't need words. You just need to get it out of your system. And the Bible says they wept until they could weep no more. But now listen, you can't cry the rest of your life. I'm going to say it over here. You can't cry the rest of your life. Several years ago, on a Memorial Day weekend, Sunday night, there had been a group of, a, a, a little group of people who were going around the area churches stealing equipment from the churches. And I was out of town in Tennessee that week, came home for Sunday. On Saturday, my son-in-law called me and he said, Pops, he said, my friend's church, he named the church. I knew them. They got hit. All their sound equipment stolen. He said, Pops, pray for them. I said, you call them and tell them if they need anything, we'll be glad to help them. He said, okay. Well, they wound up. They didn't need our help. They got some, some from someone else to get them through the Sunday. That was like on Thursday or Friday. I came home, preached Sunday morning. Everybody went and partied. It was Memorial Day weekend. We didn't have church Sunday night. I got up Monday morning. I thought, let me run down to the church. I need to get something. And when I pulled into the church parking lot, I noticed the back door here was wide open. And my heart sunk. I walked into the back of the church. The speakers were gone. Things were moved. Everything, my, my, my offices were ransacked. They tried to get into our, our, our security safes and systems, and they ransacked all the offices, busted all the doorknobs. Uh, uh, they went into the sound booth, stole a bunch of that equipment as well. It was just crazy. And I was devastated at, the, at just not the loss, because you can replace things, but it was... The fact that someone had, had came into our church and had did that to the house of God. The violation that I felt. And I remember all day on that Monday, I wept. I wept. I, I just couldn't hand, handle it. And then Monday night, we went to Cracker Barrel. 
Because nothing will soothe your soul like Cracker Barrel. But I was still weeping. I was weepy. I just couldn't believe somebody would do that to the house of God. And finally, Sister Bailey had enough of it. And she looked over at me across the table while I was weepy. And she looked at me and she said, Bill, you've got to get it together. Enough of this crying. It ain't going to help us. You've got to get that out of your system. She said, crying isn't going to help you in the long term. It'll only help you in the short term. She looked at me like a sergeant. She said, you've got to put your big boy pants on, Bill Bailey. It's okay to weep, but you can't live in weeping. The Bible says they wept. The next thing the Bible says was in verse 6, they were greatly distressed. David was. He was distressed because the people were so mad, they started to turn on him. They spoke about stoning him because they were grieved. But the Bible says the last line of verse 6, say it together with me. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Say it one more time. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. you got to remember, your brothers and sisters are not your enemy. Your brothers and your sisters are your comrades. Your brothers and sisters are exactly that. They're part of the family. And family doesn't run away from each other in times of pressure and crisis, but family sticks together in the times of pressure and crisis. And while they were about to turn on each other, the Bible said David encouraged himself in the Lord. Some of the greatest praise and worship that was heard this past week wasn't heard at a conference with hundreds or thousands in attendance. It wasn't heard off a CD player because they didn't have electricity. But some of the greatest praise and worship was heard by the heavens in the midst of devastation, in the midst of wreckage, with no electricity, with no microphones, with not a public audience. But there was some praying mama or daddy or grandmama or granddaddy or father or mother that was saying thank you Lord you saved me you saved my kids you took care of my family I will bless the Lord David encouraged himself somebody encourage yourself in the Lord if you were to read the Psalms and every day you ought to read two of them every day read at least two Psalms in your Bible stories in your personal Bible study you'll read where David encouraged himself where do you think God is a refuge and a very present help in my time of trouble where do you think that came from it came when David was in trouble when David was what was 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 crying was weeping when David had to encourage himself in the Lord so let me give you a little Bible through sister Bailey this morning you got to put your big boy or big girl pants on and pull them up and say, you know what, I'm not going to weep the rest of my life. Devil, you might have took this. Devil, this may be a big inconvenience. But my God is a good God, and he'll bring me and my family through this better than ever. <laughs> Encourage yourself in the Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me all the days of my life. Your goodness shall follow me all the days of my life. I'll walk and live in the goodness of the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Rejoice always. Thank the Lord always. It could be worse than what it is. Thank the Lord always. Somebody say amen. amen. You know who's thanking God today? Not for your calamity, but you know who's thanking God? All the landscape workers. Come on, every worker that's got a chainsaw is saying, Honey, uh, you're going to be able to get that new stove you wanted. Honey, we're going to be able to finish the house. Honey, you might get a new car once it's all over with. I know it's backward thinking, but rejoice always. God has a plan. God has a purpose. Somebody say amen. amen. Number one, weep. Someone holler, weep. weep. 
Number two, wait. Somebody holler, wait. wait. Number three, worship. Somebody holler, worship. David encouraged himself in the Lord. My worship is not based upon God's performance. My worship is based upon who God is. And so when God's word says that David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God, it's a reminder to you and I to encourage ourselves even in the midst of our trouble. The last line, he encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Somebody say his God. The Bible personalizes the Lord God as David's God. And when you understand that the God of heaven is your God, when you identify yourself and you identify him as my God, it makes a difference. I can walk through anything because I know I'm not walking alone. I know there is a fourth man in the middle of my fire. I know there's somebody in my jail cell. I know there's someone in my lion's den that I don't go anywhere or do anything by myself. But there is a Jehovah Shammah. The Lord God is present everywhere I go. Somebody holler hallelujah. Your worship should never be based upon your circumstances. Your God is not a Santa Claus or an Easter money. He's God and Maybell sung it last week. He's God on the mountaintop and he's God in the valley. You didn't think you were going to have to live that song out this quick. He's the God of the daytime, but he's also the God of the nighttime. He's the God in the good times. He's also the God of the bad times. I don't serve God like he's some fairy tooth provider. I serve God whether though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Naked I came into this world. Naked I'm going out of this world. But blessed be the name of the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, I like a Hammond B3 organ, and I believe there's going to be one in heaven. We had a B3 and a C3. They're the same organ. The B3 has a different cabinet. It looks like this. The C3 has a different cabinet, but the inside of it's the same organ. We gave the C3 to Pastor Josh Franks in his church. So it's in Savannah, Tennessee, being played this morning. Pastor Brian plays the B3. He plays it loud, too. But I like it loud. But I don't have to have a Hammond organ to worship God. I like to, but I don't have to have one. I can worship the Lord with or without it. Why? Because David encouraged himself in the Lord. In most places that you and I need to be encouraged, there's not a Hammond B3 organ present. There's not a praise team with microphones ready to enter me into the presence of God. Most of the time I need encouragement is when I'm in the time of trouble. And so I've got to encourage myself. Learn how to speak to yourself. Bailey, you're going to make it. Bailey, get a hold of yourself. Bill Bailey, give God a praise right there where you are. You've got to speak sometimes to yourself you got to preach to yourself. Are you following me? Say amen. amen. Even Dr. David Jeremiah last year, last year at the National Quartet Convention said, apart from the words that you speak to your God, the most important words you'll ever speak are to yourself. I'm going to say that again for the back row over here. Apart from the words that you speak to God, the most important words that you speak are to yourself. Speak life to yourself. We are going to make it. Well, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Declare that in your life. Walk in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Don't speak negative doom and gloom. The Lord will make a way. Some through the fire, some through the flood. God will make a way. Somebody holler worship. Fourthly this morning, 
The Bible says that David said to Abiathar the priest, verse 7, Ahimelech's son, I pray you bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the, the, the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, verse 8, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So he came into the presence of God because when you worship God, God shows up. That's why it's so important to worship him in the middle of your calamity. You need God to show up in your trouble, in your calamity. And you can't worship God without him showing up. Somebody say amen. amen. And so here he is. He's worshiping the Lord. And he worships and the presence of God fills that room. And then he begins to inquire of the Lord. He begins to ask the Lord for direction. Thank God if you'll ask the Lord for direction, he'll give it to you. Call unto me, Jeremiah said, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you know not of. If you don't know what to do, ask the Lord. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God and he will give it to you liberally. Now thank God for Pastor Bailey. you got a good pastor here. I love you. I love this church. I've given my life to this community. But you need to hear a word from God more than you need to hear Pastor Bailey's advice today. Seek the Lord while he can be found. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. If you need direction from the Lord, ask him, and he'll give you direction. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit of God will talk to you and show you. But you've got to be willing to ask him. David inquired of the Lord. Lord, shall I go? Shall I pursue? And you know what the Lord told him? The Lord told him, he said, pursue. Somebody holler, pursue. For you shall surely overtake them and without fail, recover all. Somebody say, recover all. They wept, they waited, they worshiped, but fourthly, they went to war. Now I want to tell you, this is where Sister Bailey excels in. Because she excels in war. You don't want to fight Sister Bailey. Now listen, I'm the wisdom guy. I'm the guy asking God for direction. She's the one saying, come on, let's go get them. And in every believer in this room today, there's a warrior spirit in you. You may not recognize it or understand it, but that gentle God that you think is just a little lamb inside of you, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah inside of you. Matter of fact, I read it last week. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might do what? Destroy. Somebody holler, destroy. Destroy the works of the devil. That same warrior spirit is also in you. It's in every believer who knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The Holy Spirit is water and a river and, and, and a gentleness. And we, that's what we think of of the Holy Spirit. But also the Holy Spirit is typified by fire. The fire of the Holy Ghost. You know what fire does? It burns. You know what fire does? It refines in your life. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit does desires to you do there's a power there's an anointing that, that, that there is a strength that comes by the Holy Spirit in yours and in mine's life and it will cause you to do exactly what God told David to do and that is to pursue and recover all somebody say amen, amen. so what we do we got up Thursday morning and wept when we saw all the devastation you know what we went looking we had a lot of gawkers here at the church, too. I saw them on the security cameras. They came on the property taking pictures because, you know, it's kind of a sight when you see all these big trees outside and limbs everywhere, and you think, oh, my goodness, look at all the damage. But to those to whom have a personal affection for the house of God, we didn't just look like, oh, what a sight. We looked and we thought, oh, no. And our hearts wept. And there came a time when we, then we waited. We tried to kind of get it all together. And then we began to worship and we were thankful about, God, thank you for sparing us, Lord. We may have lost some shingles. We may have lost power. But God, you spared our family. You spared our children and our grandchildren. Thank you, Lord. You took care of us. And so we began to worship the Lord. But then there comes a time in that cycle to where during our worship, we inquire of the Lord, what do we do now? 
And God speaks to us and says, you pursue and recover all. Because you know what happens is, God uses the storms to clean out our lives. God uses the storms to affect us in ways that we wouldn't deal with otherwise. And so even if we had not had any kind of structural damage, the storm coming through blew some limbs and some shrubbery out that needed to be blown out. We couldn't get to them, but the storm got to them and the wind got to them. And it cleaned out all the trees and cleaned out all the dead limbs. And during our worship, while we were thanking the Lord for that, then he begins to give us instructions to move forward. And that instruction to David was pursue and recover all. Now, I want to tell you, there was a time to weep, and there was a time to to wonder, God, why did you allow this to happen? But we should be through that now four days later. And now the word of the Lord comes to me to you to tell you to quit crying, dry those tears, but now begin to pursue. God, you had a plan. You had a purpose. And Lord, I'm believing you. I'm going to recover everything in Jesus' name. Somebody say recover. If you read Joel chapter 2, which is what us preachers call the Holy Ghost chapter, where God poured out his spirit upon all flesh. If you read it earlier, the earlier portion of that chapter in chapter 2, it talked about a sound of an alarm. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. And then secondly, there was a sound of of joy and gladness. Well, Well, secondly, actually, was what was the morning of repentance weeping and mourning. It was a sound of repentance. And thirdly, it was a sound of joy and gladness. But in that process, the scripture talked about that God was going to restore everything that the locust and the canker worm had eaten. That God would restore. Turn to your neighbor and tell him God wants to restore in your life. Restoration. And here's the wonderful thing about the Lord. Just like a bone doesn't heal with the same strength, but rather the bone heals stronger. When God restores restores back in your life, he's going to restore it back stronger, greater, and mightier than it was beforehand. You know, if you had any kind of uh, wind damage or any kind of property damage, you, you, you know what they're going to do. If you lost a window, they're going to put a window in strong enough to sustain the storm that you just endured. That window's going to be stronger. If they're going to put up a siding or some kind of sheet metal that you may have lost, they're going to put something up stronger. And the codes today, we built this building in 1990. So we're 32 years old in this building alone. And the building behind us is about half that age. Could I submit to you that whatever repairs that they'll need to do or on the uh, uh, basketball overhang, whatever we have to do, I'm sure those repairs are going to be brought in stronger because the code today is different than it was 30 years ago. So that it can sustain those types of winds. Well, listen, if we know how to do that in our natural mind, Do you not think the very God of heaven is going to instill in you that you can recover and you'll do so stronger today that you'll pursue and that God will bring back and restore back into your life, to your family, your grandchildren, your loved ones, your finances, your physical health. He's going to do it in your life and you'll be restored better and stronger than ever before in Jesus' name. Come on, declare that for your life. Verse 18, let me close this little little message today. The Bible says, you can read the rest of the story, but in verse 18, David recovered how much? Come on, class. How much? David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. Now listen, men, I don't want you to take that scripture literal. I mean, he had two wives, but I don't suggest it. Some things just weren't wise in the Old Testament, were they? Someone asked me one day, they said, Pastor Bill, would you ever think about, uh, you know, they, they were talking about that TV show where the guy has so many wives. Would you ever think about some? I said, I can't handle the one wife I got, much less anyone else. How many men say amen right there? The rest of you shut up. David recovered how much? 
All that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives and there was nothing lacking to him, to them, neither small nor great, neither son nor daughter, neither spoil nor anything that they had had taken to them. David recovered all. God said there was nothing lacking, that they got everything back. And I'm speaking life over you this morning in this room that after you have wept and after you've waited and after you've worshipped and after you have warred that there's going to be a big win, W-I-N, in your life. Get rid of the D on the end of that. I'm talking about the win that's coming in your life. No loss but gain that God will restore and you will recover it all. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everything. Both his wives. Come on, Pastor Brian. All of his family. Every son, every daughter that God allowed them to recover it all. And so this morning, I don't know what you need to recover. Maybe your house is fine, but your kids aren't. Your grandkids aren't. I'm praying your whole family be recovered in Jesus' name. Maybe you're here and you've got more month than you've got money. And you need God to do something miraculous in your life. I'm praying that God would sustain you, that you would recover it all. Somebody say hallelujah. Maybe you can't sleep at night. You lay your head down on a pillow, but you don't get any rest. You're full of anxiety and worry about the calamity that's coming upon the earth. The distress that we're experiencing. I'm praying God will give you his peace today. That you'll be able to sleep tonight. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Bailey, I'm still weeping. I just can't believe all of this devastation and all of this struggle. It's okay to weep, but you can't live in weeping. Eventually, you got to dry those tears and put your big boy or big girl pants on, like Sally told me to do, and get through it. And begin to wait and worship. Wait for God to give you instructions. And when he does, you got to go out and pursue them. The rest of that story, when Sally told me to put my big boy pants on, I mean, it, our church was destroyed. Some, I mean, somebody went in my office. They had just done everything. They had ransacked my office. They were looking for money. I was depressed. Sally says, put your big boy pants on. So I did what I know how to do the next day. I called every newspaper and every TV station I knew. We took pictures. We sent them all pictures. And I said, this is what somebody did to our church. Within 15 minutes, I had phone calls from every major newspaper in our area and every major TV news station, all showing up for interviews. By the the nighttime, we were on the 6 o'clock news everywhere. 11 o'clock news everywhere. Our, we went online with it. Those pictures had been, because I know how to promote, I know how to get, a, get the word out. Those pictures had been reshared by thousands and thousands of people. Many of them weren't even believers, but they were like somebody went in and trashed the house of God, the church, and you need to stay away from the church. Don't do that to the church. Even unbelievers had a moral code or ethics code. And while we were in the middle, TV reporters were here interviewing, police, sheriff's officers were mingling through the building. Somebody sent my my son-in-law a message and said, bro, I saw this on the internet that your church got broke into. He said, I just got offered some equipment for sale that looks like the same stuff that got stolen from your church. And so they worked out a a setup. I won't go into all of the details, but the bottom line was within 24 hours, God had restored and given us every bit of that equipment back. Hallelujah! It happened on a Sunday night 
We got everything back by Wednesday night. The people that stole our equipment, they were so dumb. It has electronic uh, uh, signatures on it. In other words, in other words, if you try to take one of our sound system boards, it has all of our names and codes inside of it. They couldn't even deny that it was ours because all that my son-in-law had to do was the, the sheriff's officer said, are you sure this is yours? He said, plug it in and I'll, I'll, I'll prove to you. He plugged it in, turned on the power button. There was all of our names and the settings and the sound equipment. The sheriff's officer said, that's pretty cool. I've never seen that before. Jay looked at him and said, well, what, well, what do we need to do? Does it have to go back, go back? He said, you can take it all but one piece of equipment. I've got to take one piece back to the sheriff's office, but I'll get it back to you within a week. Hallelujah to God. Jay put all of the stuff back in his trunk. Don't tell me we don't serve a God who will not restore and cause you to recover all. Everybody stand. Everybody standing. So this morning, lift up your heads. Seek the Lord and ask Him for direction. If you, if you need God to help you answer some questions, so be it. Say, Lord, I need your help. I need some direction right now. This storm has brought chaos. God, help me. And hopefully you've got some direction. But if you don't by now, ask the Lord. And God's talking. Look, give me 60 seconds. God's talking. If you're not hearing anything from the Lord, it's not His fault. Ask the Lord, and He'll speak to you. Our God doesn't play hide and seek. He's not playing games with you. If you need to hear from the Lord, ask Him. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. He'll speak to you. And then when He does, then you've got to be willing to pursue You've got to take that first step. And I remember those mighty clouds of joy. They'd come in here and sing that great old black gospel group. They'd sing, if you'll take one step, he'll take two. Because there ain't no limit to what God can do. But you've got to take that first step and be willing to do it in Jesus' name. And let me tell you, Marissa, sometimes I've taken that step. And then when I took it, I was like, my God, I don't believe what I'm about doing right here. When Sally and I bought our first house, some of y'all will remember this. When you bought your first house, we bought that house. And when we walked away, we had the keys. We thanked God. We went in. We opened that door. We said, boy, this is incredible. This is our house. And then once we sat down and that ooey-gooey feeling subsided, then we wondered, how in the world are we going to pay for this house? How many has ever had that happen? But I'm here to tell you, 32 years later, there's still a roof over our head. That God's been good to us, and we're still paying. Pursue. Somebody holler, pursue. And when you do, God's got to win with your name attached to it. He wants you to win. God don't want you to lose. God's not pleased. Some, Sally, don't, I promise you I'm almost done. I'm quitting early anyway. So, Sally, don't like me to use the word ignorant, but some ignorant person, they didn't mean to be ignorant. They were just dumb. You know, some people, if you just let them talk long enough, they'll show you how stupid they are. And they prayed, a, they, they said something like this, and you've heard it. Well, I just want to praise God. He heard my prayer. That storm didn't come here. It went down there to them people in Fort Myers. And I just want to praise the Lord. Well, don't you think those people in Fort Myers were praying the same prayer that you were? God didn't just think you were special, so he, he creamed them and didn't cream you. There's no partiality in the Lord. God didn't send the storm. God didn't hate Fort Myers. I heard somebody one time say the reason New Louisiana gets all the bad storms is because of all the debauchery in New Orleans. I'm going to tell you, have you lived in Bradenton long enough to see there's debauchery here? Not just up there. 
I don't have time to teach you about Genesis 2 and 3 and the fall of man and sin being imputed into mankind. And it's because sin, he's the ruler of this world. That's the reason why we have all this stuff happening in the world today. It's not because God sent it. It's because we live in a sin-cursed world. And until the rapture of the church, until we're exited out of here, this world will continue I don't care how many electric cars they put on the planet. The world as we know it will eventually end with a ball of fire. We know that from the Bible. And it may just very well be all those electric cars catching on fire that causes it. Read your Bible. But don't be ignorant. God doesn't love you any more than he loves the people in Fort Myers. But so today, God wants all of us to win. And you know what God's going to do to those precious people in Fort Myers and Naples and Charlotte and Ponte Gorda? They're going to weep. They're going to wait. But then eventually, they're going to war. And they're going to pursue. And they're going to win in Jesus' name. I know you've already been in the altars once, but I want every person that says, Pastor Bill, you're talking to me today. You preach to me today. I'm going to do exactly what Paul said. I'm going to do exactly what he told the church at Thessalonica. Put it back up there real quickly, Wisley. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, or Wislow. Pray always. Everybody say, pray pray always. Verse 16, rejoice always. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. So I want some thankful people to come and let's fill this altar while they sing the blessing over us today. We're going to pray and then we're going to release you. But if you're able to come, would you come right now? Sing it, Brian. Lord bless you. Sing it out. And keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is 
Give the Lord a good praise this morning. We plan to work in the offices this week, and so uh, the church will be open during the day. If you need anything, you call us. If there's a way we could help you and your family. I know most of you are pretty much situated now, but if there is, you let us know. And, um, and again, there's, there's ice here. There's restrooms here. There's air, air conditioning here. Uh, shower here so if, if you do need that uh, please um, let us know and we'll be glad to help you if there's something at your home or residence uh, if you need the guys to come by uh, we'll 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 do that we'll, we we've got a couple of things we have to do for a couple of our elderly folks and, and we'll be glad to assist but hopefully you're you're all right and we just thank the lord for his goodness amen amen, amen. amen. We're not going to have church tonight so that it just lets you continue and get it all done, cleaned up, kind of get your minds wrapped around getting ready for this coming week, back to work. I know kids are out of school tomorrow. And then Wednesday night, we'll be back on schedule, and next week, church is normal, and we'll just, we'll just uh, kick it off and look forward to a great, great time. We have made some changes on some of our special events. And so there's an updated uh, Sunday night schedule out in the lobby. You can pick that up. There are some changes on there, so you can grab that. But uh, the Lord is good, and we've celebrated his faithfulness and his goodness today. I want to thank you for being in church today because, man, you showed your heart. by I'm going to church. I'm going to get in the house of God. I'm going to worship. And uh, thank you for being here today. What a blessing to see you. <laughs> Sally, I want to hear a prayer from my mama today. Pray over all these people and dismiss us today. Father, we thank you for your protection, Lord, this, this week, Lord, as we weathered this storm. Lord, we just give you all the, gray, gray, the praise for that, Lord. Lord, as they go their ways today, Lord, I ask you to be with them. Lord, as they are cleaning up or whatever they do, Lord, they're going to be doing it as unto you. Lord, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody.